So look around this room. We are the 1%. According to the World Bank, if you're single and you make more than $34,000 a year, you're a member of the global 1%. Uh, we know that the distance in well-being between us and a top billionaire is minuscule compared to the distance in well-being between us and the bottom billion. The people in this room have been propelled up Maslow's mythical hierarchy of needs, so we're not preoccupied with how we're going to find clean drinking water for our baby by sundown. We're preoccupied with saving the whole world. Everybody has a passion. Feed the world. Bring health care to the working poor. My wife is very preoccupied with the plight of the elephants. I want to submit that all these problems are symptoms of a deeper, more fundamental problem that humanity must solve. Governments are the only technology which does not make progress rapidly and peacefully. Why does the average South Korean live 26 years longer than the average North Korean? The global ecology of voluntary transactions that builds wealth flows wherever exchange with others improves our lives. The most important factor to our lives is not our talents or our education, it's the arbitrary tax farm where we're born, left over after some old war that draws an invisible line between us and others who would transact with us. This graph is evidence of inequality. It's also evidence of a humanitarian singularity. The reason you and I are in the global 1% is because of breakaway experiments in governance. The United States was a giant life raft where poor people from dysfunctional governments could come try out their modern ideas. Over 130 years, U.S. per person GDP grew 10 times. When Hong Kong gained independence, Chinese peasants swam across shark-infested waters to live there. Over the next 36 years, Hong Kong's per person GDP grew 87 times. When Singapore broke away from Malaysia, the average income was 511 US dollars. 45 years later, 17% of Singaporeans are millionaires. While Africa as a whole went backwards in most measures of well-being, the African island of Mauritius ran itself like a startup. When it gained independence, 40% of Mauritians were living below the poverty line in shacks made out of trash. 36 years later, almost 90% of Mauritians own their own homes. Beat that, America. <laughs> Mauritius is a test pilot seastead. I'm Joe Quirk. I wrote a book about evolution. Any humanitarian who understands the principles of evolution should be a seasteader. Seasteaders plan to provide you with the technology to found your own floating nation on the ocean. And seasteading is already happening. Shell's prelude is larger than the Empire State Building, and it will be floating in international waters for up to 25 years. Cruise ships are the size of skyscrapers, and people attend rock concerts in them. Bumper cars, water slides, Disney extravaganzas, anything you do on land, people are doing on cruise ships. Park a dozen of these babies next to each other, you got yourself the beginnings of a floating city. Nearly half the world's surface is a blank slate, unclaimed by existing governments, and we want to create a thousand startup governments on the sea. Why the ocean? 
because water is different from land. The reason land governments are cluster fracks is be because they're monopolies. Each of us is born into a fixed geography. Some government from a previous century claims us. What if you think they cost too much and provide too little? You can't switch to a competing provider without leaving your land. You're stuck, landlocked. If you can float, you're mobile. Imagine if your city was like a floating jigsaw puzzle. You can shift and assemble and reassemble at will. Governments could only form if people choose to attach to each other. If you got in a political fight, you could detach your houseboat, sail somewhere else, link up with your allies, found your own floating nation. If you can vote with your house, governments will compete to attract citizens. This will fundamentally change the relationship between the government and the governed, such that public servants will become something they've never been before. Servants <laughs> of the public. Primitive continental governments are founded mostly by conquerors. Future ocean governments will be founded by creators, aquapreneurs. <laughs> Name me a problem you care about. I can tell you about an aquapreneur who is working to solve that problem by engaging the freedom and the power of the sea. Do you care about global warming? Or do you care about feeding the poor? Environmentalist and humanitarian goals are in conflict if we think about agriculture. They have the same solution if we think about aquaculture. Ricardo Radulovic is an agricultural water scientist from Costa Rica, and he plans to feed the world with greenhouse gas. His secret is algae farms. Algae transform the carbon and nutrient pollution we've dumped into the ocean into edible sea crops. The more carbon algae pulls out of the ocean, the more carbon the ocean pulls out of the air. Ricardo Radulovic is teaching the poor how to grow floating algae farms that can fit together like a jigsaw puzzle and scale up to any size. Ricardo's Sea Gardens project has earned grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Bank. In the 20th century, Norman Borlaug's Green Revolution saved over a billion lives. In the 21st century, get ready for Ricardo Radulovic's Blue Revolution. What else do you care about? How about a clean, green, renewable source of energy for the whole world? The ocean is the largest solar panel in the world. Patrick Takahashi, a biochemical uh, engineer from Hawaii, plans to create sustainable eco-cities using ocean thermal energy conversion, or OTEC, a proven green technology that uses the ocean as a solar panel. Lockheed Martin says that water will be the next oil. They plan to build an OTEC plant off the coast of China. Right now, a half dozen island nations are setting up OTEC plants. What else do you care about? How about long, healthy lives for your children? How about a singularity at sea? James Clement, biotech entrepreneur, insists that humanity is on the cusp of a medical revolution that is going to make Alzheimer's, heart disease, and stroke sound as old-fashioned as cholera, whooping cough, and mumps. What's holding back this revolution? Regulations written in 1970 are holding back innovations coming in 2020. James and others plan to conduct scientific research at sea. Diabetes, heart disease, stroke, James says we can end these diseases soon. Those who say it's impossible shouldn't stand in the way of do people doing it. If they fail, investors lose money. If they succeed, 
James says people in this audience will live to be 120. The first floating city with substantial political autonomy could be established by 2020. My ocean brother, Randolph Hankin, commissioned the Dutch aquatic engineering firm to design our floating city. Uh, they're called DeltaSync. And DeltaSync ultimately plans to use algae to transform coastal runoff into food and fuel. Is it doable? We walked on the moon 45 years ago. It's easier to float than fly. It's cheaper to build sea stations than space stations. If we want to feed 10 billion people with a sustainable civilization by 2050, humanity needs to re-engage the source of all life, the ocean. Then the sky will be the limit. Ocean first, space second. We want uh, an X prize for aquapreneurs. Thanks for listening.